Part 1 You'll hear a conversation. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Good morning, Heathrow Airport Lost Property Office. How can I help you? Good morning. I lost a briefcase at your airport yesterday and would like to report it, please. Certainly, sir. Could you give me a brief description, please? Of course. It's a very light brown briefcase, about 50 centimetres wide and 30 centimetres high. It's quite distinctive because it has a bright red clasp on the front and red trimmings. The handle is black. My initials A-E-J are on the clasp. Ah, just a minute, sir. I remember a briefcase matching that description being handed in yesterday. At about what time did you lose it? My flight arrived from Sydney just after three in the afternoon. I had taken the briefcase onto my flight as hand luggage. After disembarking, it would have been almost four o'clock when I picked up uh, my check-in luggage and left my briefcase at the carousel. It was so foolish of me. Yes, here is the logbook. I'll just check that it's here. Do you have a pen and paper? You'll need to write down a few things to remember for when you claim your briefcase. I'll just get that while you're checking. Hello, are you there? Yes, is my briefcase there? It is. When you come to claim it, you'll need to tell whoever is on duty the lost property number. That's EDV758. Have you got that? EDV758. Got it. You'll also need to bring some identification with you. Something with your photograph on it. Most people present their passport. Yes, of course. I'm flying to Austria next week, so I'll pick it up then. That'll be fine. You'll have your passport with you, no doubt, so that can serve as identification. My flight is in the evening, so I won't be at the airport until 7 o'clock at the earliest. Will the office be open at that time? Yes, sir. We're open until 6. Sorry, I mean from 6 in the morning until midnight, every day. Great. I just need to know where your office is. It's in the main concourse of Terminal 1 at the airport. Will you be coming by taxi, by car? I'll be arriving by underground. OK, in that case, get off at the stop for Terminal 1. Go up the escalator to the main concourse. At the top of the escalator, turn left and you'll see a large departures board, an electronic one. If you face this, you should see our office off to the right, in the corner. It's clearly signposted. Up the escalator, turn left. Off to the right of the departures board, got it. Thank you very much for your help. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at the questions. That's what we're here for. I only wish we could return all the items we get handed in to us. I guess you get dozens of items every day. Yes, we've built up quite a collection. What happens to the things that remain unclaimed, if you don't mind my asking? Not at all. We keep each item for a minimum of three months. 
twice a year in June and December we have a sale. The proceeds from the sale in June go towards the keep of the office and the proceeds from the December sale go to a children's charity. The sales are by auction and attract a lot of interest from passengers and staff as well as from the general public. How interesting. One final thing. Who handed in my briefcase? It would be nice to thank them personally. I'm afraid there's no record of that, sir. What a pity. Well, thank you very much for your help. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 20. Good afternoon everybody, my name's Sophie West and I'm here to give you some information and answer your questions about money when you're studying abroad. To obtain any form of entry clearance into the country where you wish to study, you will need to prove that you have enough money to cover your tuition, accommodation fees and living expenses. Therefore, you need to arrange all your funding ahead of time. Start by working out how much money you will need. I believe that you will be having a presentation on that topic later this week, so I won't go into detail about it now. If you are hoping for a scholarship to help pay for your studies, then start making inquiries and applications now. The chance of arranging a bursary or scholarship, or major funding after arrival, is minimal so it is essential to apply before you leave home. To find out what scholarships are available, you can contact the university you intend to study at and the Ministry of Education in your own country for further information. Let's look at possibilities for moving your money abroad. It is very risky to carry large amounts of cash when you're travelling. When the time comes to travel abroad, Plan to take just enough cash to meet your immediate needs and send the rest of your funds by another method, such as international money order, bank draft, electronic transfer or telegraphic transfer. Let's go through those one by one, shall we? You can buy an international money order before you leave and then when you get to the country you're going to study in, you can pay it directly into your bank account. You can also exchange international money orders for cash at certain places. Remember to take your passport with you when you do this. A bank draft is similar to an international money order, except that you can only pay it into a bank account. You cannot exchange it for cash. Ask to have it made out to you in the local currency and draw on a local bank. That way you will not pay a commission fee when you pay it into your account and the funds will take less time to clear, that is, to move through the system and into your account. An electronic transfer is when your bank in your home country transfers funds from your home account directly to your account abroad. This is often the easiest way to transfer money, but it cannot be arranged until you have opened a bank account abroad. Telegraphic transfer is the fastest way to send money overseas but it is also the most expensive. As with an electronic transfer, you can only arrange a telegraphic transfer after you have opened your bank account abroad. It cannot be arranged in advance. 
Most English-speaking countries place no limit to the amount of money you can bring into the country, but your government may control the flow of money in and out of your own country. In that case, you'll need to find out as soon as possible how to get permission to transfer money, whether there is a limit to how much you can transfer, and what regulations you must comply with. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at the questions. For further information, contact your local bank for advice on how to transfer your funds abroad. When you first go abroad, you will have lots of things to do, and it may be a few days before you are able to approach a bank and open a bank account. And once you do, it may take a while for your transferred funds to clear through the banking system. So altogether, it could be anywhere from one to three weeks before you have access to the funds you transfer. Obviously, you will need some other sources of money in the meantime. The possibilities include cash, traveler's checks, and credit cards. Let's take a look at each of them. As I mentioned earlier, you should not carry large amounts of cash, but do bring a certain amount to cover the costs of your first few days or so. Cash is very useful for covering small purchases, such as drinks and snacks. If any of your dependents are traveling with you, you will obviously need to bring more cash. Most international airports have 24-hour bank or bureau de change where you can change overseas currency or traveler's checks no matter what time you arrive. However, bear in mind that the exchange rates at these bureau de change are not very good. Keep this in mind when planning your cash needs. You can also exchange money at banks. In English-speaking countries, most are open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday, and on Saturday mornings. If you arrive outside those hours, plan to either exchange your money at the airport or seaport, or bring enough cash to cover your needs until the banks open. Travelers' checks are much safer than carrying cash, as they are insured against loss or theft. They can be cashed at banks and bureaux de change, and travellers' checks made out in their local currency can also be used like cash in many shops and restaurants. But check with the staff in each case to be sure to avoid embarrassment. Credit cards are widely accepted as payment in English-speaking countries, and you can also use them to get cash from the machines at banks. However, check with your bank at home to find out how much commission you will be charged if you use your home credit card abroad. It could be quite substantial. Now, let's take a look at... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk between a tutor and a student. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 30. 
Good morning. I'm here for our meeting about creating lesson plans. Ah, yes, bang on time. Come in and take a seat. Now, didn't I ask you to prepare something? Yes, you did. You asked me to think of the possible uses for a lesson plan. Here's what I came up with. First, it helps the teacher with the pay timing of a class. Second, it creates a focus for the teacher and also for the students. Third, it shows everyone what material is being covered, needs to be covered, or has been covered. That's particularly useful if you have a strict syllabus to follow. However, there does seem to be a need for a balance between covering material and choosing when to let a class flow. And let students carry on an activity if it's leading to learning. Yes, that's certainly true. Anything else? It gives clear aims to the students and to the teacher. I think it's worth remembering that there are two perspectives to consider in the learning process. It also serves as a reminder for teachers to put aims first and materials second, rather than vice versa. Those are the five I came up with. I think that you've got the most important, the key points. I can add another five. A lesson plan also helps to highlight potential student problems and creates an opportunity to find a solution. Second, it brings cohesion and coherence to a lesson. Third, it clearly shows the interaction between teacher and student, or at least the expected interaction. As we both know, lesson plans don't always go according to plan. A lesson plan also clearly shows something else: the distribution of time spent on different skills. This can really show if your speaking or writing class is really about speaking or writing. And finally, it serves to remind you what materials you have to take into class. Thank you. I've made a note of those points. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at the questions. Take a look at this incomplete lesson plan. Do you have any ideas about what could be added to each section? Let's see. The students are at low intermediate level, and the lesson will last for 50 minutes. The students are academic ones, staying in Australia for three months to improve their spoken English. The aim of the class is to elicit reading comprehension and speaking abilities for storytelling. As well as to practice the present simple and the past simple tenses. Can you think of any personal aims that the teacher may have? Hmm. Perhaps one could be to avoid excessive instructions. That's a good suggestion. What assumptions would you make if you were the teacher? Uh, I'd assume that the students could understand the instructions. The topic is extreme sports. Hmm. Perhaps I'd assume that they do not understand some of the vocabulary related to those sports. For example, the difference between mountain climbing and rock climbing. So that would qualify as an anticipated problem. Ah,、uh, yes, yes, it would. And what solutions would you suggest? Solutions. Perhaps one solution would be to elicit the difference from students via questioning. Yes, that would work. Given their level, the students should be able to provide some answers to that using fairly basic vocabulary. At the bottom, you can see a list of aids: textbook, blackboard, chalk, chalk eraser, pictures of rock climbing and mountain climbing. Ah, the pictures will help to explain the vocabulary. A picture dictionary can be very useful in such situations. By the way, when I write the name of any textbooks I'm using. Would you suggest that I add some details? You mean like the publisher and page numbers? Yes. I would certainly note down the page numbers. It's probably a good idea to add the author, but probably not necessary to add the publisher. Mind you, if other people are going to see your lesson plan, it might be a good idea because they might want the book themselves. Knowing the publisher makes it easier for them to find it.
Do you recommend keeping lesson plans? Having stored plans for years, it has become clear to me that no two classes are exactly alike, and this limits the potential for recycling lesson plans. However, one suggestion I can make is that you keep your ideas rather than necessarily the whole plan. These can be kept on postcards that are organised by topic, perhaps with cross references for level, skill, or structure. And then kept for easy access. This is really easy if you do it on a computer. Can you recommend any books for helping creation of lesson plans? My favourite book is Lesson Plans from Nothing by John Davis. You can get it from the bookstore on campus. If you're interested in knowing how others do their lesson plans, or just simply need a lesson plan now because you have no time, try these websites. That looks like a useful list. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. More and more American parents are becoming interested in having their children learn Chinese. This is not only a case of having their children attend private classes or of schools teaching the language instead of or in addition to the West European languages that are traditionally studied in the states, like Spanish, French, and German. Oh no! Studying geometry can be taxing for any ten-year-old, but a select number of American schools, children are not only learning about angles; they're doing it in Chinese. This select number of schools is growing, since Chinese is a hot language thanks to China's surging economy and growing world clout. Even children as young as six are honing their Chinese at school, motivated by a mix of parental prodding. And their own desire to do something different. I went to see one of these schools, and it, it really is amazing when you walk into a kindergarten classroom, and the children are understanding what the teacher is saying, and it's all in Chinese. Half of the time, the kids aren't even aware that the teacher is speaking a different language; they just fall right into it. The United States has declared this year to be the year of languages. Although few Americans are aware of the designation, according to a survey by the Language Association, more college students are studying foreign languages than ever before. Enrollment in Chinese has risen by 20 percent over the past three years. The 1.4 million students learning 15 leading languages represents a 17 percent increase over the same period. However, only 9.3 percent of Americans are able to speak a second tongue, compared to 52.7 percent of Europeans, according to the Census Bureau. At first glance, weighty national priorities take a back seat to the fun of cultural exchange at Potomac Elementary. Hallways are festooned with Chinese art and learning aids, such as stuffed animals labeled with Chinese names. Children sing Chinese folk songs and American nursery rhymes in Chinese. In the fifth grade immersion class, songs and games come only after a rigorous vocabulary drill, and lessons on triangles and trapezoids, all taught in Chinese. The students are good at listening and do pretty well at reading. 
but writing is their weak point, according to the class teacher, who has a PhD in education and was a teacher in his native Beijing. I asked two of the children, a boy and a girl, about their experiences of learning Chinese. The boy said that mastering Chinese characters was tough. When I asked why, he said that he finds the writing particularly hard because you have to do the strokes in the right order. The girl said that learning Chinese is cool, and that she is starting to catch on to the complex writing system of characters that contain elements of meaning and sound. She pointed out that it is quite different to English because there is nothing like letters to refer to. However, she noted that she can remember how to write Coca-Cola in Chinese because it has a lot of little boxes that refer to a mouth. This visual aspect of Chinese characters and how it influences children when they are learning the language is a theme I'll return to later. Even though it is clearly the parents who are pushing for more Chinese classes, my research revealed that they are not usually pushing their children too hard, which I think is a good thing. Parents of the kids say they are loath to plan careers for ten-year-olds. To quote one of them. Even if my child doesn't use her Chinese going forward, she's learned so much about another culture. Some of the parents are encouraging their children, directly or indirectly, by taking night classes in Chinese. This has been proven to be a great motivator. If children see their parents learning something, they will usually take an interest in learning it too, or at least take a greater interest in learning generally. Dreams of selling Coca-Cola and other American products to China have helped drive the interest in Chinese studies. According to the Language Association, 640 U.S. colleges offer Chinese programs, while 102 schools from kindergarten to 12th grade teach Chinese. Teaching Chinese is also of keen interest to the U.S. government, which launched the National Education Program in 1994. To fund university studies of languages of key world regions, including East Asia and the Middle East, in 2002, the NEP announced that it was placing particular emphasis on programs to teach Arabic, Chinese, Korean, and Russian. I spoke to some students who had just started learning Chinese here at this university. All of them had learnt Chinese since the age of 11, and some had started even earlier. Student A said he had started learning Chinese eight years ago because he thought it would be pretty fun. However, as he began contemplating college, he recognized that there were good opportunities for employment in China upon graduation. As he said, China is expanding fast, and now they need services, including lawyers and business people. Student B said that she wants to follow her father. And start her own business and have an office in China. Student C said that he thought his studies would bring national gain as well as personal achievement. To quote him, when a lot of kids like us grow up and hopefully are able to speak Chinese and get a job with businesses who are trading and doing business with China, it will be a big leap for our country. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.